<clears throat> praise the Lord and uh, we give God all the thanks for tonight and we give him the praise that today is Wednesday and today is a very special Wednesday. It's also the first day of the week uh, of, of the month of March. Uh, the sunrise month, the, the third month of the year 2023. And uh, what a day to begin the third month. <clears throat> and um, as we started last week, um, looking at conflict resolution within the marital context, um, we couldn't finish everything. And so tonight, we are continuing the second part of it. And here, God willing, I will be delving a little more into the mechanics, the mechanics of conflict resolution in the marriage setting. But there was an aspect that we couldn't finish last week. And that is um, taking a positive and constructive attitude um, towards conflict. Attitude is everything. And um, no matter how bad situations are, if we develop positive attitude, um, constructive worldview, and we seek to learn from it and build up upon the broken pieces with God on our side we are always better off anyway don't forget to share the link with family and friends invite every married couple that you know and those who are about to be married uh, call them and invite them in share the link with them and um this is a lesson that will really be a blessing. I mean, everybody will need it. Whether you are two hours, uh, your marriage is two hours old or 20 years old or um, 25 years old or even 50 years old, you still will have something to um, keep under your belt. What I call you will have something in your first aid toolbox uh, for marital resolutions and it will be helpful to you. So please share it with somebody. Let us pray. Father, we give you praise tonight. Marriage is a supernatural, it's a divine institution that you gave us. It's the gift that you gave our world. Lord, we ask that you will help us and teach us and instruct us and show us the right ways especially in conflict resolution wherever there are there is conflict our prayer that peace will prevail and the conflict will lead to a construction that will fortify the walls of the union and bring prosperity and peace to every home in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So, <clears throat> marital conflict resolution. This is the second part. Don't forget that uh, last week we were looking more at the hygiene factors. Uh, when I say hygiene factors, those are um, the prelims. And usually they are attitudinal. Uh, meant to clean the house, uh, preferably, or the aim there is that that will even eliminate the conflict. However, in reality, um, even as individuals, we are often conflicted within ourselves. Uh, and that is the source of all conflicts. We are usually conflicted within ourselves as individuals. We are double-minded, we are in a dilemma, and uh, sometimes we don't even understand our individual selves, let alone understand another person. So 
we know that conflicts are inevitable but conflicts need not degenerate into hostility whilst conflicts are inevitable hostility are preventable we can we can prevent that hostile uh, atmosphere where as it were we are looking to eliminate one another we are even looking to kill one another we are even looking to the downfall wishing the other uh, evil that is when hostility has set in and that is what we aim to prevent in this counseling the <clears throat> greatest gift of god to the general human divine institution that he gave to the general human uh, society is, is marriage and family and when two people two partners husband and wife when they they make up their mind they resolved in the depths of their heart to stick it together and until death do us part and are willing to pay the price to keep the union they have resolved to pay whatever price necessary to keep the union god will always make a way even where there is no way there will always be a, a, a solution for resolution some may be more costly uh, some resolutions may require greater sacrifices than others but god will never leave us with a problem that has no solution and don't forget our ultimate goal is to avoid divorce and separation why because in the beginning according to jesus god never intended marriages to end in divorces and separations it is never part of the original plan and then number two uh, divorces and separations are not i mean they are never good solution they are not a perfect solution let me put it that way uh, as much as it may be viable under certain circumstances where jesus said there is hardness of heart by and large willingness to resolve and willingness to make the necessary sacrifices and pay the price for uh, resolution uh, holds better promises and better profit uh, for the couple and um, their family and the larger society you know it's always beneficial if couples can stay together in harmony rather than when they are you know the situation is so acrimonious that the only viable option is that they should divorce it's it's always a tragedy uh, it's always not fair but um you know what can man do when two people decide not to live together again so let me quickly read colossians chapter 3 the third chapter of the epistle of paul to colossians uh, chapter 3 let's read verses 12 to 17 which will serve as the backdrop uh, i'm not going to teach the passage i'm going to draw the lessons and we use it to develop pragmatic uh, mechanisms for resolving uh, <clears throat> the the conflicts that confront marital couples colossians chapter 3 from verses 12 let us hear the word of the lord therefore as the elect of god holy and beloved put on tender mercies look at the qualities character qualities the holy spirit is telling us we need in our marriage he says number one tender mercies kindness humility meekness long suffering verse 13 
bearing with one another in other words accommodating one another considering one another you know and forgiving one another there is no surviving couples that have not had opportunity to practice forgiveness if you are afraid to forgive if you are never going to forgive then you are going to have a very, your marriage will have a very short lifespan okay if anyone has complaint against the other even as christ forgive gave you so you also must do <laughs> that is a tall order look at how gracious how kind how merciful how uh magnanimous christ was and is to us and he says that should be the measure of our forgiveness in marital relationship verse 14 but above all put on love which is the bond of perfection the bond of perfection the holy spirit says is love verse 15 and let the peace of God rule in your heart. In other words, uh, the peace that we have received from God, we should let that uh, spread out and flow out to one another in our marital situation. Of course, there are other interpretations, which means let it be the umpire. In other words, whatever you are doing, you must do it for the purposes of peace and living peaceably with your spouse you whatever you are doing is to contribute towards the peaceful the tranquil the harmonious and uh, um, kind of smooth going relationship between you and your spouse you are you shouldn't be a rabble rouser in the in the marriage you are always sparking fires as it were and throwing matches into the uh into the into the fuel no you should be working for peace you should be a firefighter so that even when fires are um you know springing up you get your wet blanket and put it on it and quench it all right okay let's keep reading and we are at Colossians chapter 3. Now verse 16. Let the word of God... Oh, sorry, I, I jumped verse 15. Let's finish verse 15. And let the peace of God rule in your heart, to which also you were called in one body, and be thankful. Mm. Be thankful for your spouse all the time. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and in spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And verse 17, And whatever you do in your marriage, in word or deed, do all in the name of Jesus Christ, giving thanks to God the Father through him. So from this passage, Whatever you cannot say, in the name of Jesus, I say this to you, my husband. In the name of Jesus, I say this to you, my wife. In the name of Jesus, I do this to you, my husband. In the name of Jesus, I do this to you, my wife. If you can't do or say that in the name of Jesus, that means you shouldn't even do it or say it at all. <laughs> that is what Paul is saying, that whatever we do, we should do it in the marital dynamics. We should do it to one another in the name of Jesus. But let's finish off. What are some of the positive uh, uh, or the benefit? What are some of the productive uh, results or lessons that can even come from conflict situation? Once again, Conflicts are inevitable, but conflicts need not degenerate into hostility. And we want to avoid 
hostile, acrimonious atmosphere in the home so that you can build upon that and give a secured place for one another, naked but not ashamed, but also a secured place for your children. Number one, conflicts, disagreements, even arguments uh, do reveal blind spots in our lives that needs attention. So that is one thing. Through the conflicts, we discover some things that we didn't even know um, were, were, were part of our attitude. Number two, it provides opportunity to uh, improve upon your communication skills, you know, um, convincing your wife, convincing your husband. You learn some few communication skills on the job. <laughs> in that uh, resolve conflicts when conflicts are eventually resolved they end up improving relationships it, it, they, it kind of spice up the relationship you know there cannot be testimony without tests so some the conflicts are tests uh, that we take and through that graduate from one level of grace one level of the image of Christ, one, one level of harmonious, I mean, glorious harmony uh, to another. And you should not be afraid to come together um, just because your neighbors heard you fight or insult one another. The neighbors may be going through the same thing, and if they see that with all that happened, you have still come together in peace. Who knows? They'll come to you for advice when they also get into that severe and fierce trouble. Resolve conflict after another leads to maturity. You know, if you met a couple that have lived together for 20 years, it simply means they have learned to overcome trials and temptations and troubles for 20 years. That is why we say they are matured or they have experience. That is why as a general rule of leadership, when, when you have two people who are equally qualified and one is married and the other is not married, um, all other things being equal, that leadership role will be given to the married one as a matter of preference. Um, <clears throat> of course, that's not the only thing considered for leadership, both in the secular and in the sacred, the spiritual, the church realm, and in the secular uh, leadership, they still look out for married couples as as a preference for leadership because they know you know how to take some you know how to suck in some nonsense and how to how to take in some heat and still not overreact um, if you have met any couple that have been together for uh, anything beyond two years uh, but you know five years 10 years 20 years 30 years 40 years huh they have learned some things. They know some things that you do not know. And they have much, they've learned it by experience and have grown um, thereby. You know, but this is just a general rule in leadership. Even in the church, the Bible recommends that people appointed into a deaconship and eldership are men and, and bishops are men and women who are able to maintain their home as a general rule hallelujah number five resolve conflict brings comfort and consolation and encouragement to not only the 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 spouses the couple but also to <coughs> excuse me to the world at large, children are happier, um, siblings are happier, extended family is happy, 
neighbors are happy, friends are happy, even colleagues at work are happy. Uh, society is, a, is in a better place when couples are living together in harmony. So whenever we resolve conflicts, um, the whole world rejoices at that, including the church. Excuse me. Hallelujah. Anointing also comes by drinking water, you know. <laughs> Amen. And number six, resolve conflicts <clears throat> help us to measure our spouse's tolerance level. Everyone is different, and every two couples, every 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 couple are also different. <clears throat> and different people have different tolerance levels for different provocations and irritations. This is also helpful, <clears throat> you know, as couples you tease one another, maybe some jestings and some jokes. Um, conflicts and their resolution helps you to measure the tolerance level of your spouse. So you know which jokes are too expensive. Because sometimes a joke that will be passed over by one spouse may not do for another. And so you know that, well, I don't take this to my wife. I don't take this to my husband. Okay? Just because somebody did it to their wife and the wife was accommodating uh, does not necessarily mean that your wife will also accommodate that. So the Bible says that every husband must love your own wife and every wife must respect your own husband. So there are some peculiarities and some particularities that every couple must observe and learn about their particular spouse so that they play the game according to the spouse's tolerance level and not just by general rules and general expectations. There is an interesting <clears throat> passage written by Apostle James. Bishop, let me call him Bishop James. Bishop James, he was the bishop of the Church of Jerusalem. And in James chapter 4, he clearly spelled out what brings conflicts and what brings fights um, in us and among uh, people all the time, you know. <clears throat> so let's go to James chapter 4 from verses 1 and 2. Let's hear the word of God. Where do wars and fights come from among you? Do they not come from your desires for pleasure that war in your members you lust and do not have you murder and covet and you do not obtain you fight and war yet you do not have because you do not ask this is a very powerful uh, <clears throat> passage in the Bible telling us where the sources of conflicts and fights and quarrels and hostilities in the world as a whole, but in this context, in our marriages. And so not all the conflicts are coming from demons and witches, you know, from the village, you know, coming to disrupt your marriages. It's not every one of those conflicts that are because of curses. Yeah, some of them may have their roots in some curses and some uh, demonic uh, ma machineries. However, by and large, the Bible says that they come from our desires for pleasure and our lust and our medros attitudes and our covetous attitude. Covetousness, being medros, being lustful, and our in only the desire for pleasure. Those are the sources of the conflicts between us 
and <clears throat> our spouses so how do we resolve them let me say here again that we all need to grow the fruits of the spirit in our hearts the character of christ in us we that is how to really um build up a, a harmonious marital home the fruit of the spirits as lifted in galatians chapter 5 from verses 22 to 25 it's you can see some of it also in philippians chapter 1 uh, verses 19 to 20 no, sorry philippians chapter 1 verse 9 you can see some of the fruits of the spirit over there and what we just read colossians chapter 12 uh, verses 12 to sorry colossians chapter 3 verses 12 to 17 there also you have some of the fruits of the spirit these are the passages that has uh, a collection of the fruits of the spirit which are also necessary for marital conflict resolutions hallelujah <clears throat> so number one in conflict resolution james says in chapter 4 verse 2 the last portion that we do not have because we do not ask so the first thing is we should pray we do not have because we do not pray um many we should pray for our husbands we should pray for our wives it's, it's a prayer we should do all the time and i i tell you i'm not saying this as a as a spiritual man as just because i'm a gospel minister but i'm saying this as a powerful weapon or tool in conflict resolution pray for your wife pray for your husband one of the things that i have learned practically is that it's very difficult to be continually or continuously angry at a person you are praying for if you are genuinely making intercession with groanings by the holy spirit for the person eventually love will well up within you and burn uh, i mean melt away the hardness of heart so that is a very important thing and uh, <clears throat> i'm not saying it as a matter of christian slogan you know we need to address and redress all stalemates the stalemates are not healthy the silent wars in marital relationships are not healthy maybe necessary for a little cool off but should not be prolonged so then james continues that <clears throat> we the, the second thing is that control your anger control your anger uh, ephesians chapter 4 verses 26 and 27 he says be angry but do not sin and verse 27 says do not give place to the devil actually the bible said don't let the sun go down on your anger in other words you could be angry but don't keep the anger for so long number one and number two don't let the anger control your reaction that is where we make mistakes many times the reason for your anger could be legitimate and it could be right whatever whatever happened probably <clears throat> was wrong and you were wrong and you were <clears throat> injustice was meted out to you and you are in that sense your anger is justified but the bible says as justified as your anger may be don't let your anger control you and tell you what to do and how to react don't let the anger control you you can be angry anger in itself is not sin but if you let the anger control you the anger will lead you to sin okay so don't give the devil the chance and that means don't let <clears throat> your anger persevere for so long don't let it persist for so long how can you be angry at your spouse for five years two years uh, three years i mean one week you know and all everything is a silent treat 
in the house. So what does the Apostle James say from chapter 1, verse 19 to and 20? <clears throat> it's very powerful concerning anger. Uh, he says, so then, verse 19, my beloved brethren, you know, brethren and sistering, <laughs> let every man be, this is how you help resolve conflict, conflict number one, swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. You know, triple S, triple S, three S's. Swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. So therefore, <clears throat> that, that's, and that's the second thing. The first thing is that we should pray about the conflict. The second thing is that you should get ready to listen to what your spouse is saying. You know, many when there is argument, we don't listen to one another. Each one is trying to speak over the voice of the other. And so we, we are making noise, we are talking, but we are not hearing anything. You are not hearing your wife, <clears throat> and your wife is not hearing you. So therefore, there is no communication. You are only blowing out your, your, your anger, your hot air, kind of clearing your chest. You are just dumping your trash <clears throat> on your spouse. And he's not even taking it anyway. So remember the three S's. Be swift to hear and slow to speak and slow to be angry. Some people quickly get angry. Even if you ask a simple question, um, they, they are already angry. And they just, even if you ask, where is my food? Or what food is available tonight? I mean, they can just, it can, that, even that simple question can set them off. Let alone, if you are looking for your keys and you can't find it, and you ask your spouse, and he's not in the right mood, you know what will happen to you. You know, but we should be willing to listen. Listening is a sign of respect. Listening in itself is therapeutic. It is able to heal anger when you listen. So learn to listen. And verse 20 of James chapter 1 is what I found I find very helpful. He says, For the wrath of a man does not produce the righteous, does not produce the righteousness of God. Okay, so anytime you are angry, whatever you are going to do or say, Bishop James is saying that it does not work the righteous purposes of God. When you read other translations, it says the anger of a man does not produce the righteous purposes of God. You see, so anytime you are angry, understand that you are in a slippery ground and you are in a temptation and therefore you need to be extra careful you know people have done all kind of outrageous things under the uh under the the motivation of anger <clears throat> that is why the bible says, be angry but do not sin and the apostle james says that your anger, no matter how legitimate and justified and reasonable your anger is, it does not work the righteous purposes of God. In other words, God doesn't need your anger in order to do what he says he will do. Okay, so be careful that when we are angry, we still allow the Holy Spirit to control us and to influence us. <clears throat> number three. So number one, pray. Number two, control your anger. And that means you have to, sh you have to keep quiet and listen to one person. Two people can talk at the same time, but you can't listen to both at the same time. You, even though we have two ears, we can only listen to one voice at a time. Okay? 
All right, so number three, avoid physical and verbal abuse. And these two usually <clears throat> um, follow after anger. If you allow your anger to control you, you are, not, uh, you are more likely to be abusive verbally or physically. The, you know, verbal abuse is as bad as physical abuse. The only thing is that in court of law, it's very difficult to prove verbal abuse. But physical abuse, there could be lacerations and hand marks and uh, bruises and black eye, which will all be evidence of physical abuse. But when people insult you and, and, and ridicule you, and are very disrespectful and spiteful and scornful of you. Uh, probably unless you were smart and you recorded the words on your smartphone. Otherwise, uh, th there's no other way you can prove it. However, it does not make the injury, the emotional, the injury on the soul through verbal abuse are uh, as painful as physical injury um, to the physical body. You know, of course, it's easier to prove physical injury. So if you beat your wife, you know, she will call the police and she will have evidence on her body. And um, I tell men, especially, uh, I know some women, some wives can beat their husbands, you know, <laughs> but generally it's the husbands that beat their wives. I warn the husbands, please don't do that because when you do that, you take the case out of love to law. And when it gets to the realm of law, it's, it's a whole different ball game. The policemen will come, the lawyers will get involved, the judges will come, prosecutors will come, evidence will be whatever. You go to court, you'll be saying my Lord and all that stuff. So you don't want to get into the clutches of the law. And the only way you are going to stay out of the clutches of the law is to stay in love. Ah, the Bible says that where there is love, there is no law. As long as you and your spouse are living in love, no lawyer will bother you. No judge will bother you. No court will bother you. The law, the court, the lawyers, the prosecutors, the policemen, the case men and women, they all come in when love fails. So the Bible is true that where there is love, there is no law. No law can operate. So as long as husband, you are loving your wife, wife, you are respecting your, your husband, no law will come against you. The law will come in when you fail. So why don't we keep the dynamics and the details of our, our marriages in love so that you will keep the law away. So for the, uh, 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 those who are verbally abusive, uh, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. So says the Holy Scriptures. But, you know, that which is good to the use and edifying and may minister grace to your spouse. I have paraphrased it there. So the words that you are speaking, are they ministering grace, grace to, your, to your spouse? If not, then you got to change it. Brothers and sisters, words matter. What you say matters. And the Bible has a whole lot to say about the words that come out of our mouth. Jesus even warned us in the New Testament <clears throat> that we shouldn't use insult and abusive words on one another. And that any word that proceeds out of any careless words, I'm Bishop, I was angry. That's why I said it. Well, that's what the Bible also says. Be angry, but do not sin. Don't let your anger control you. So letting your anger 
influence you is not a justification for what you have done. And um, I'll come to it that to redress it, you may have to apologize, you may have to say sorry, and you may have to be receive forgiveness. Number four, in conflict resolution, sometimes <clears throat> it may be necessary to call a two-man conference, uh, not a three-man. That means there is no abiat, uh, uh, arbitrator. But here, the two of you should first discuss it or attempt to discuss the conflict. <clears throat> now, to discuss the conflict means you are not going to argue, <clears throat> you know, and uh, I, I always say that the conference should be preceded by a period of truth, a period of calmness. Everyone should, the, the partners should, kind, I call it time out, but not time out where you leave the marriage. No, time out where you allow tempest to cool off a little bit, you know. And to do that, you must be willing to drop the, what I call the hot potato uh, uh, issue. You know, when, when a particular issue has become a hot potato, a, a hot coal of fire, the moment you touch it, it begins to spark and the sparks begin to fly, um, those hot potato issues, we still need to talk about them. But you need, it should be, the conference should be preceded for, by a period of cooling down and calmness, you know. So you should pick it at an uh, appropriate time, and it should be a set time where you sit down to talk about it. <clears throat> And in that conference, you must begin by listening to one another. You know, you must be willing to listen without interruption. <laughs> I know it's very tough, especially for the ladies. Uh, men generally will be speaking slowly. And uh, ladies are generally better at speaking much more quickly. Okay? Okay. So it's important that first let ladies first let the, your wife talk and tell you the husband her side of the story and give her a listening ear without interruption let let her finish her whole presentation as it were then the wife after you have made your presentation should also keep quiet and give your husband a listening ear. Even if you disagree with what he is saying, still listen to his point of view. And in the listening, <clears throat> what you are doing is you are listening to understand her worldview, her point of view, her perspective of the situation. You want to understand her perspective in order to understand her so that he, she will be able to you'll be able to communicate your case for her to understand you. So the, the, the slogan is understand in order to be understood. Okay. Understand. You may not agree with what your wife is saying, but listen to her to the point of understanding what where she's coming from, her lines of argument, her perspective about the situation, her perception of what uh, the situation was, her interpretation of <clears throat> what the situation was. Listen to understand her, and then you can also be understood by her. And vice versa. Wife, listen to your husband to understand where he's coming from and you may not agree with his argument but then understand why he's arguing that way okay or understand his <clears throat> line of argument how he builds his case his perception of the situation and his interpretation of your words your gestures what you did and what you didn't do 
listen to his side of it, how he sees it. Because the principle is understand, then you can be understood. So, and the secret to understanding is listening. So, if you won't listen, you're not going to understand. <clears throat> you know, even the gospel. You see, right? How can they believe if they have not heard? So, how can you understand your husband if you haven't heard? If you haven't listened to him? How can you understand your wife if you haven't listened to her? Okay, so in the conference, you should spend more time listening to one another rather than arguing, you know. And seek to be agreeable, not disagreeable. Like we say in my local dialect, I mean, I mean, I mean, I can say, I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean, you no, know, no, no, no. You, in other words, once I say no, it is no. If it is no, it is no way. You know, in, in, in Ghana English, we say one plug or one way. You know, it's either my way or no way. If it is not my way, no way. You know, that is wrong. Okay. So seek <clears throat> to be agreeable. And that is the essence of cleaving in the five foundational principles for a healthy marriage cleave you know <clears throat> now now that you have listened to your wife <clears throat> and your wife has listened to you you should now move on to the next step at in the conference the next step is to propound solutions so okay now mrs i have heard you now what are your suggestions for solution to this issue now mister that's the wife i have heard you husband so now what are your options for resolving what should we do about it and you should use the the pronoun we we what should we do about it okay and so and you should list the options, the, res uh, the solution options. One, two, three, four. And then discuss maybe number one. Probably number one will not work because of this. Number two. Number two, probably we can use the first part of number two. And probably you may have to cut and paste. Take some from number one and then a small part from number two. And take a chunk of number three. And take a little bit of number four and make a package, a resolution package going forward. From this day forward, we are going to do A, B, C, D to resolve similar situations that may come up. <clears throat> so then out of the conflict, you have become a counselor. You have developed even more tools of resolution and you have formed some formula and some methods of resolving similar conflicts that may come up. And who knows, when they work, you could even use that to counsel other couple when they get into such issues. As part of the conference, you should learn to say, I'm sorry, forgive me. And here you should do it genuinely and not make excuses. You see, you know, I'm sorry I slapped you. It is because you insulted me. That is why I slapped you. That is not an apology. It should simply be, I'm sorry I slapped you. Forgive me. And you should say, I'm sorry I insulted you. Forgive me. Okay? So that is how you should, without excuses. Without excuses. And that means we got to be humble. God resists the proud and he gives grace to the humble. So wife, be humble. Husband, be humble. You are not the only one that has made a mistake or has committed sin. Just humbly accept your error, your sin, your mistake. Ask for forgiveness and trust God that your spouse will be gracious enough to forgive you. And of course, if somebody says, I'm sorry, 
forgive me, the other spouse should respond verbally. Okay, I forgive you. Let us move on. And that is where we move on but pair the solutions we have generated from the conference <clears throat> and discussions. Hallelujah. No marriage will survive without the practice of forgiveness. The practice of apology and forgiveness. Asking and receiving forgiveness. Asking, giving and receiving forgiveness. No marriage couple, uh, marriage institution, uh, group or couple will survive without that. So we must get ready to practice it just as the Father has forgiven us. And uh, <clears throat> num uh, number five under the conference is that never keep records of wrongs. Because when you keep records of wrongs, they become cumulative. And when they become cumulative, they become mountainous. So they become almost an impossible mountain to climb. So <clears throat> what do you do? Tackle them piece by piece. When you are given a, a plate full of rice, maybe jollof rice or fried rice to eat, you don't take the whole plate and put everything in your mouth at the same time. What do you do? You take a small spoon or fork and you begin to take pieces, small morsels of the rice on that big plate. And sooner than later, you find out that you have consumed everything that was on the plate. But you didn't put it all into your mouth at once. You put it in small pieces, in small pieces, in small pieces. That is how we resolve issues. You may not be able to resolve the whole issue in that big picture situation. So you take pieces of it and resolve them. And as you resolve the pieces, the other pieces become easier and simpler to resolve. And then eventually you find out that you have resolved the whole issue. That is why you should not keep record of wrongs, but rather let it be gone. <clears throat> and number five. So under number four is call a conference. And under the conference, listen to one another, seek to be agreeable, seek to understand and be understood. Consider a list of solutions or resolutions and refine it and shortlist those lists and choose at least one that you are going to work with in, as a way of moving forward. Practice saying, I'm sorry and forgive me. And also, I forgive you. Let's move on. And don't keep records of wrong. That is for the conference. And then number five, and the last, I think that's the last one, yes, is that practice negotiations. <laughs> Maybe because I did business management, that's why I believe in negotiations. You should practice negotiations. So, that means that in negotiate every war ends in negotiations. Today, Russia and Ukraine are fighting. No matter how many people they kill, no matter how many cities they destroy, no matter how many airplanes or ships that are destroyed, at the end of the day, they will sit by the negotiation table and talk peace. No war has ended in war. Every war ends in negotiations. So going to negotiations is part of human life. Okay. And so remember, anytime you are going to negotiate, understand that you will not get 100% what you want. Negotiation begins with compromise. And in marriage, compromise is very good. Okay. And I'm not saying compromise on some principles, godly principles. What is sin is sin. So that cannot be compromised upon. But we can do forgiveness and reconciliation. Okay? You, in, anytime you come to compromise, you can't get 100% your way. We are going to share it 50-50, 60-40, 70-30, 80-20, 90 
9010 or even 99 to 1. <laughs> so whatever it is, if it is going to be negotiations, you can get everything you want 100%. Okay? So <clears throat> compromise. Number two, in under uh, negotiation, share, share responsibility. Share the burden, share the blessings. Share the burden, share the blessings. Share the burden, share the blessings. So maybe it's about parenting and taking care, babysitting the baby. Share the responsibility about dishwashing. Share the responsibility about some expenses that have cropped up. Share the responsibility. Don't just shift just because it is uh, his mother that is dead, you shift all the responsibilities upon him or the financial. No, you share the burden, okay? The funeral burden. <clears throat> the number uh, C under negotiation, practicing negotiation. One other negotiation uh, mechanism is um, the four way stop in traffic, especially in America. You get to a crossroad and it's first come first serve. Uh, you know, Americans have perfected in that. I wonder if that will work in Africa. <laughs> anyway, so sometimes that is what you do. You practice the four-way stop. You use that. That means that the first person to make the request or the first person to happen to be in that situation, we resolve her or his first and then we go to the second one. Okay, there are times you can't just do both at the same time. So you do the, you choose to do one. And one way to do it is first come first serve. Okay, or you can practice ladies first. So anytime when it comes to resolving an issue, you let, you resolve that of your wife first. You solve that of your wife's problem first. And then you solve, you, you together, you solve your own too. Another mechanism is traffic light, which is another way of the four-way. Traffic light, you know, when you get to crossroads, um, uh, a part of the, the cars may be coming from north to south and south to north. And the other will be crossing from east to west and west to east. Okay. Now, if there are no traffic lights and all of you are coming, you are going to crash at the intersection and nobody can go. So what do we do? The traffic light will give red to those coming from east and those coming from west. And give green to those coming from north and those coming from south. So those coming from north and south will then go, have their go. And when they are done or after a while, they will get red. And then east and west will get green and they will also go. So in some situations, the only way to resolve is today. Wife, have your way today. Today, get all the benefits. Tomorrow, then you let the husband also have his way. Okay? That's how we, we, we live together. And sometimes too, you trade. You trade. Okay? If you get this, then I am also going to get that. Not tit for tat. But we are trading off. Okay? We are trading off. So if I give you the extra $50 to buy your dress for your friend's party, then when you return from the party, you are going to babysit the baby for two days for the $50. And I will have my chance to go out for two days. To do my work <laughs> so there is a trade-off we trade you know you know make it work and sometimes finally if you can't find a compromise then you do lottery <laughs> you 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 throw the coin and uh, whoever wins gets his or her way <laughs> but at the end of the day in conclusion let me say here that the goal should not be that the wife will win or the husband will win. It shouldn't be either or. 
The goal is that the marital union wins. So every time you are discussing issues, any time you come to conflict resolution, have the goal as let the marriage win. Let the union win. Except, as Jesus said, there is hardness of heart. Which Jesus is clear that in the beginning, it was not so. I pray for every husband that you will continually love your wife. I pray for every wife that you will continually respect your husband. I pray for every conflict situation that is degenerating into acrimonious relationship. That let there be peace. Let there be tranquility. The Lord grant you wisdom from above, which is peaceable and lovely and gracious, that will work for unity. Where men say there is no way, I declare there is a way. What is impossible with men are possible with God. God bless you. Shalom. Bye-bye.